Ignition sequence start. Six. Five. It's one small four, step for man. Two. One. Everything is going. Welcome to Stay Relevant, my wandering conversations with interesting people. I'm Mike Cibola. Welcome with me today is Don Lampassoni. Hey, Don. Hey, how's it going? Good. Don is a media creator. We were discussing his title, and um, we decided media creator is a good title. Um, yeah, I like that. And why? Why is it? Well, because it kind of says I do a lot of stuff with media. <laughs> not, <laughs> just, <laughs> not just one thing. That's know? true. It's kind of hard to say writer, producer, director, editor, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. And then people are like, well, what don't you do? And I guess maybe that would be easier. Well, then, but that could be also be negative. It could be negative. You know, well, you must not be good at any of them. That that's a good point. <laughs> that's a, maybe I should not. Maybe I should think about that. I don't know. No, although <laughs> no, but media creator, yeah. it's broad enough without sounding too broad. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. So, which yeah. part do you create? Do you so somebody who wants a shooter will, may call you and say, "Do you shoot? You're a media creator." Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, yes, yeah. I say I'm a director of do photography. You write? Yes, I do. I'm a media I, creator. Yeah, I mean, I might I might not push the writing. Okay. You know, I might not push okay. that because no, I don't. I write with, with help of someone talking, is what I would say. Well, you be- still, I'm, yeah, you're I'm still... better. I'm better at writing when I have like interviews and stuff like that. But if I have to just do like a VO piece, I could do it. But it, you probably, I probably would want to get someone that's better than me, at that. Yeah. You know, that's one of the areas where I would, I would be like, yeah, you know, depends on what it is. You know, I have a certain voice that I think I'm good at. But then, you know, if it's like corporate stuff, I might say that's probably not my forte for, you know, uh, writing wise. But if we just want to interview a bunch of people, I'm really good at editing them to make them sound great. Cool. So that part of it I could do really well. Well, I was looking at at your background, which I didn't know. You went to Miami Dade College at some point. So you went from Miami and then you went to Alaska. Is that true? I mean, you went... Yes, yes. Well, Miami Dade was actually... um, the school that accredited the conservatory that I went to. Okay. So what I did was, and this is a little weird, and you can say that it was, um, is I was in a musical theater program. I thought I wanted to be an actor. And, you know, they call that what I was as a triple threat because I could sing and I could dance and I could act. Um, but apparently so, you couldn't. But, well, <laughs> <laughs> you're right. <laughs> apparently what, what I did was is I realized while I was in that program, I did it for two years, and I realized um, I'm not going to make any money doing this unless, you know, somehow I win the lottery, which the lottery would be making it big somehow. And, you know, great for all the people that go and go down that route and they really want to do it. But I felt at that time that I needed to do something to make media myself. And I saw an opportunity with the Army to make media and that opportunity was becoming a broadcaster in the Army. And so that's the route I took. And, you know, the Army is like, oh, well, um, where do you live? Fort Lauderdale? Okay, um, how about Alaska? <laughs> 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 and I, I had a choice of my job, but I didn't have a choice of where I went. It's crazy. How was Alaska? Just briefly, I mean, it's a sidebar. Actually, Actually, I mean, Alaska was great. I loved it. I mean, I wouldn't want to live there my whole life. I lived there for three and a half years, but it was a great time. And you were in the Army for like six years? Six and a half. Yeah, and, and um, you know, that's that's pretty good training. I mean, I'm thinking, right? Now, there is a really good school. It's actually close by here, Fort Meade, Dinfos, that I went to. That I thought, you know, I've been to a lot of different colleges. As you've noticed on my resume, I've been to a lot of different colleges. And they had one of the best training for broadcast that I've I've experienced. Um, it's really quick. It's like three months and that really got me going. It got me excited to do it. And, um, you know, I learned the basics. They have some advanced training too that they did while I was there, um, as well. While I was in the army, my last three years was with soldiers radio and television. And that was great too. Um, and while I was there, I, I freelanced, I started freelancing. I got a call one day for an edit. Um, and, um, I think I was my first edit with Interface was uh, for um, for BET, and they really liked what I did. I think it, uh, a two day edit turned into like a week or a week and a half, 
Um, we did this thing for boxing or something for uh, Vander Holyfield at the time. I can't remember exactly what it was, but um, it was really fun. I really liked working there and uh, it was a great experience. And I just started freelancing with them. Um, you know, now and then I think uh, political season came up at some point and I did like a month or a month and a half with them and I was still in the army. And then, you know, I saw that hey, this, this is a pretty good deal, <laughs> the whole freelancing thing. And so I you know, was ready to re-enlist and I said, you know what, I'm just going to get out because money-wise, I, I thought I, reach, I, uh, I had gotten to a, sort of a plateau of my career and, um, and um, I, was, I could go further in the Army, but at the time I wasn't, I wasn't really, um, I had gotten to SRTV, which was basically the best place for a broadcaster. They would send me overseas or something if I would have stayed in, and I kind of liked the area, and, and so, I, so I got out, you know, and I started freelancing. Well, we worked together at Ventana and Ventana, Moondog, yeah, and that, that was that, that was, was a full time gig, and I love that. Yeah, that was a couple of years, and then we went. Then you uh, eventually moved to to Houston, I guess. Well, Austin, Austin, okay. Austin. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, so I moved to Austin, and, um, I spent and why did you do that? Was it uh, were you following a girl? I, I was. Well, well yeah, my wife. <laughs> Well, it was, it was my turn, you know, <laughs> she'd followed me from Alaska. My wife had followed me from Alaska here and we spent like nine years here. And then her job took her to the Austin area. And I figured, Hey, Austin's kind of cool. I've never been there. Why not? You know, and we're kind of a military family. And so, you know, moving's not, it's not out of the question for us. And so we moved on to Austin. Um, and, uh, you know, there was good and bad there. You know, it was, a, it was a hard time and a, and a great time at the same time for my career. Um, I learned a lot, I could tell you that, because I started teaching. <laughs> yeah, you, you mentioned the fact that the market's not, well, it's not a D.C. market. You, the, the, the rates aren't the same, and, and you're expected to do more, I guess. Exactly. Um, in a market like that, because it's smaller, it kind of brought me back to sort of my roots in the Army where I was doing everything. And um, I became a shooter, editor, kind of everything again person. Whereas in D.C. at the time, no one would hire me for anything but editing. I was just an Avid editor at that t in that time period because a lot of people didn't know how to use Avid at that time. It wasn't easy. It wasn't like you had access to it. And because I had known it, you know, I learned it. And, you know, and I, had, I was a DS artist for a little bit there um, uh, before I left to Austin. And... Um, and, you know, knowing those types of systems, they're a little more complicated. And, and really, it's not the complicated part of it that's hard. It was the access to the system. Because those systems were so expensive, it's not like you could just download the software and, and load it on your, any computer. It wouldn't work on just any computer. It needed a lot of hardware. Did you feel um, like you had planned this whole route or just sort of happened? Or I mean, kind of a combination of both? I think I think it was the, the Austin thing kind of just happened. And, you know, I just got a call one day out of the blue from someone from the Art Institute. And they was like, they saw my resume for, I don't know how they saw it. You know, it's just one of those things, you know, now that everything's online, they just saw it and thought I'd be a good candidate for teaching. And I was like, well, I never taught before. <laughs> and he's like, well, you have a master's, so you could pretty much teach anything, at least, you know, uh, anything that we offer you to teach. And, you know, and I found out a lot about teaching and about myself, about what I really knew. <laughs> right. <laughs> because when you teach something, you really, really have to know it. But also, I find I'm not a good teacher. I don't have patience. <laughs> yeah. And it, it takes patience and it takes, um, you got to, you, you have to figure out how to present it so that somebody can understand it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that sounds simple, but it's. It's it, not. I it mean. was harder than I thought, but I, I learned to have fun with it. And I learned to, um, uh, you know, I had fun with the students. I kind of missed that aspect of my life a little bit because it was like the energy I got from the students was great. You know, it was kind of like the same energy you get, or at least I got when I was acting in a sense, because you're sort of performing in front of them. Not a performance, but you're, you know you're presenting to them and you're talking to them. And if I had like three or four classes in a day, it takes a lot out of you to do that. And, you know, I, I definitely got to hand it to people that, that teach because it's, it's difficult. And, and, but there is a lot of reward there too. I think I learned just as much as my students did, if 
if hopefully they learned. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking to media creator Don Lampasoni. Don, um, how would you say you've managed to stay relevant? I mean, what's your is there is there a secret to that? What does it mean to you, and how do you do it? Is it just rolling with the flow? I don't what? know. If, I don't do you have a plan? I, or it just happens. <laughs> I don't know if there's any secrets, um, but I think that one thing I do is is I try to stay up on what's new and cool in technology. I try to not say to myself, I'm only going to do this one thing this way forever. I always try to do something new in a, in a, in a piece. I, I, you know, I'm fine with, you know, if a client comes and say, oh, we did it this way last time, let's just do it that way. Okay. And I know, you know, I have guidelines, you know, but what I really love is when someone comes to me and says, you know, I want you to try some new stuff because it might take me a little longer because you're figuring stuff out. Um, but you get to really, uh, you know, maybe delve into a new piece of software or a new plugin or something that's new out there and make something just uh, that you haven't done before. Maybe someone else has done it, but, but I haven't done it. And that, that makes it, you know, one more badge to add to my, you know, list of things that I've done. How do you, how do you stay um, current? With, I mean, there's so much stuff. I, mean, I think if you're working at a facility, it's easier, I would think, on, on one hand, because there's somebody who's kind of paying attention to that, and you're kind of being brought up to speed. Things are being brought in, and you're kind of able to, to utilize them and stay up to speed. But um, if you're on your own or if you're freelancing, it, I, I'm thinking it's, it's more difficult. I think there's, there's good and bad with both. I think when I was at a facility... Um, there's always other people to bounce stuff off of. You always can go into another room and say, hey, what do you think of this? Or, you know, hey, I've got, you know, have you heard of this plugin? Is it any good? You know, um, hey, you know, you have an idea for this? I'm out of ideas. You know, you can bounce stuff off of people. And I think people is the main thing that you don't have when you're freelancing all the time. Uh, I mean, obviously you have the people you're working with, but they're expecting you to be the expert. You know, when you're in a facility, you have other experts like yourself, and that's great. And, and that's what I, you know, that's what you have. But the truth of it is, is that you also have limitations in a facility because there's obviously budgets, you know, and there's budgets for yourself, but, or, or there's like, we're only going to use this software. You know, when a, when a facility says, you know, we're going to do Final Cut X and you're like, well, I hate Final Cut X, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you have to deal with that and just push on and learn it. And, you know, every day you're a little frustrated and that's okay. You know, I can, I can do that. And I've done that. Um, when I'm alone, it's just a matter of just, you know, a lot more reading the technical stuff that's out there, trying to stay in touch with people. You know, I think people is the aspect that you're, that you're probably talking about there that you got to keep up with too. The other people in the industry. It sounds like that's an important thing, but it's on the other hand, if, you're busy you can't do it and yeah. it's like well it's like making a demo reel exactly <laughs> like, right that's a has, good point yeah. who has time to make a demo reel if you're busy all the time and then well you don't need to because you're busy all the time right it's a lot easier now with you know just having an iphone you can just make a small comment and read something on a break um speaking of the iphone you know people are doing things movies on their iphones um the technology has gone from you know needing hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to edit non-linearly to now, you know, being able to do it for practically nothing. You have everything in one device that you can do things that we couldn't even imagine, you know, 10 years ago. Um, how has that like changed things? Um, I found it a lot more in Texas than I found here. Here I see people want the professional to do things um, for the most part. Now, um, I've been out you know, I do see, okay, okay, let me take that back. Cause I do see occasionally like someone will just pick up a camera and like, Oh, I can shoot this. You know, it happens a lot with political stuff. They just send somebody out, an intern to go shoot an event. And then you get the footage and you're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, you get like maybe two shots, you know, yeah. Oh, well, we only needed two shots. Okay. Well, then I guess it worked, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it I, I really think the old adage, you get what you pay for, I think that's, you, usually they're going to cost less if they're charging less if they don't really know what they're doing most of the time, um, you know. That's coming from an expert 
Who charges more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm sure that the, the greenhorn who doesn't yes. charge much would tell you, well, I'm just as good. I just haven't had the chance. And it's, I guess it's possible. But I, I maintain that experience is worth a lot, that you, you learn things through your experience. And I don't know, at some point that's going to come into play if it doesn't every, every day. You know, this came up a lot when I was teaching is like, you know, the students would think that, oh, well, I'm, you know, just as smart as you and I can do this just as good as you. And then they would go do it. You know, they would do a project. We would always, because uh, Art Institute is a hands-on, and it was one of, the, one of the things I really liked about it is the hands-on. And, you know, I'd always be like, yeah, you can do it. Okay, we'll see. And I would always let them spout off and, you know, talk, and then I would get their project in, and I'd be like, here's everything that's wrong with this. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot. And now, granted, there are some people that are talented right off the bat. But there's that experience, it's, and it's a hard thing to teach. That's one of the hardest things to teach is like how to make a decision when something goes wrong. And I think that's what the experience does. It's like, why do I call myself a DP now instead of like a videographer? Well, I think the difference between a DP and a videographer might be, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, is that a DP can go into any situation and light it and make it work. Whereas a videographer would just go and shoot it and it might not look so great. But a DP is going to make it look as good as possible. And they know how to use what they have to make, you know, that image look right. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it does. Yeah. yeah okay. I mean, a videographer may not know how to light it. Exactly. As we, I mean, yeah, they I mean, might that, just that know that would how be the hold the camera. <laughs> if somebody said they're a videographer, that tells me one thing. If they say they're a DP, well, I expect something else. Yeah. One of the things that comes with experience, something that, that it took me a long time to figure out, was that um, is, is what to leave out. I think that that's a huge problem in the edit because what happens now is you get these, you know, uh, these files from DSLRs and from all these cameras um, that's just like overshot. You have no thought. so much overshooting. It's like, let's just shoot everything and right. not think about what we're shooting. That way we have everything. Then you can decide. <laughs> Which is not necessarily true because yeah. if you don't know what you need going in, you may not get it. So what's the, the, what's the future? Like, I mean, we've kind of come really far away from like, you know, from, from uh, video being kind of elitist. You had to go through the gatekeepers to everybody having it now. Very democratized media. Um, video is now everybody can use it um, which is good in a way but um, are we pulling back do you see us pulling back at all or, or do you think it, it, there's always been the, the segment that has realized that they need the experts and where, where does it go from here do you know I think when people see a difference in their products in their video product that's where you stay relevant obviously there's technical things brings the future. You have like 4K, they talk about 8K in the Olympics, and I think in 2020, you know, so you have that, but I think that's just size. That's, that's not going to change story. You know, I, I always, I always say this, you know, I, I shot a pilot for my masters, um, and, um, it, it was a, a comedy. It was called Post House. And, um, you know, we shot it in HD at the time. This was 2005. And that was kind of a big deal at the time. We shot with like the same camera that uh, it was Ventana, you know, gave us the gear to shoot it with because I was working there. And I edited on the DS and, you know, I'm like, I could talk all this nice technical stuff about this, but it doesn't make it any funnier. True. Just because I shot it in HD does not make it any funnier. It doesn't make the story any better. Really, story is ultimately the main thing that you should worry about. And we're, and we're all storytellers no matter what we do. If, if you, you need an element of a story to keep people's interest. And that's Absolutely. The technical is good to know, and I think that's the part where it's going to get a little easier. But the story part, not everybody's a storyteller. And I think what you're really high, I said media creator, I probably should have said storyteller is my job. I'm a storyteller, not a media creator. Because that's what I do. I tell stories every day, some kind of story, whether it's a 30 second commercial, or it's a corporate piece that is, you know, talking about whatever corporation that, you know, saying how great they are. <laughs> you know, really, that's what it is, storytelling. Well, cool. We'll leave it at that. Don Lampsoni, thanks for joining me, man. I appreciate it. No problem. It's fun to be here. Thanks a lot.
The podcast is Stay Relevant, wandering conversations with interesting people. Original music by Popmark Media on the web at popmarkmedia.com. See and hear more on my website at mikesabola.com. Until next time, try and stay relevant.